Welcome to this mini lecture on gluconeogenesis, or how we synthesize glucose to prevent hypoglycemia during long-term fasting. Gluconeogenesis, occurring in the liver and the kidney cortex, is required for maintaining blood glucose levels in, during long-term fasting. Gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors like lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. Note that all of these are converted first to glucose 6-phosphate, which is trapped inside hepatocytes, and glucose 6-phosphatase is specifically required to hydrolyze that phosphate off to allow glucose to re be released into the blood. Here's the pathway of gluconeogenesis compared to glycolysis. So for gluconeogenesis, we start at the bottom of this image, and it shows that if we start with 3-carbon pyruvate, down at the very bottom, the first thing that happens is that it gets carboxylated to become 4-carbon oxaloacetate. And many amino acids also directly contribute to making oxaloacetate or to providing um, 4 or 5-carbon intermediates of the TCA cycle, which can also give more oxaloacetate. Then oxaloacetate is converted to phosphoenolpyruvate using this enzyme that's got the long name phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase, and we usually abbreviate this to PEPCK because it is so long. This is another energy requiring step. And uh, remember, a phosphoenolpyruvate is a, has a high energy phosphate intermediate, so we need to put in a lot of energy to synthesize it. And the carbon dioxide comes back off, so we're back to a three carbon intermediate. Then the next several steps are completely in common between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So all of these steps are completely shared between the two reactions. And uh, we end up then putting two of the three carbon intermediates together, so dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Again, both of them have phosphates. They're combined by aldolase to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So all those reactions in the middle are shared between gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. Then for gluconeogenesis, we hydrolyze off the phosphate on the first carbon using fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So we see a phosphate coming off and we get fructose 6-phosphate, which I summarizes to glucose 6-phosphate. And this is where glucose 6-phosphatase comes in to hydrolyze the phosphate off to release free glucose. This image shows the first steps of gluconeogenesis on the metabolic map. So if we start here with lactate, so during exercise, one of the key roles of the liver is to take up lactate released from exercising muscle, convert it back to pyruvate, which enters the mitochondria through the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier, then gets carboxylated by pyruvate carboxylase to oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate can't leave the mitochondria, so it actually gets reduced to malate, which can leave through a transporter, leave the mitochondria, and so now we have malate in the cytosol, which can be oxidized back to oxaloacetate. Okay, so there's a, an additional step we didn't mention before. And now that enzyme PEPCK converts the oxaloacetate to phosphoenopyruvate, and we go back through all those common steps of glycolysis. Here's the remainder of gluconeogenesis. With all of these steps, shared between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Here's our phosphatase for cleaving off, hydrolyzing off one of the phosphates, and our second phosphatase up here, glucose 6-phosphatase, that are specific for gluconeogenesis. Note also that glycerol, that gets released when uh, fat is broken down, triacylglycerols are broken down, and fatty acids are released from adipocytes. Additionally, Glycerol is released from those adipocytes, and the liver phosphorylates it and converts it to dihydroxyacetone phosphate, where it can enter gluconeogenesis. So what prevents a futile cycle of glucose being catabolized by glycolysis only to have that pyruvate resynthesized to glucose by gluconeogenesis in hepatocytes?
Well, it has to do with the regulation of the key enzymes that are different between these pathways. So think about when insulin levels are high, blood glucose levels are high, under those conditions, insulin signaling activates the glucokinase or the hexokinase in liver cells, activates phosphofructokinase 1, and activates pyruvate kinase. When insulin levels drop as we go into fasting, those enzymes are all inhibited, and instead, the glucagon response, having glucagon, cortisol, and low insulin, activates all of the specific enzymes shown on the left side, so pyruvate, carboxylase, PEPCK, uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, and glucose 6-phosphatase. So to summarize the hormonal regulation, when insulin and glucose are plentiful, glycolysis is stimulated as well as glycogen synthesis. When we move to the fasting state, glucagon is secreted, as well as cortisol, so particularly cortisol is, is high in our blood in the morning, um, and in the presence of low insulin, then gluconeogenesis is stimulated. We previously discussed how the activation of hepatic glycogen breakdown is a fast process through the activation of glycogen phosphorylase downstream of glucagon signaling. By contrast, the activation of gluconeogenesis is a slower, more sustained process, and this occurs primarily through transcriptional regulation, so the production of more molecules of the enzymes that are specific for gluconeogenesis. This cartoon depicts how glucagon signaling activates the transcription of one of the gluconeogenic enzymes, PEPCK. So when glucagon binds its receptor, this activates a G protein, which activates adenylate cyclase, which makes more cyclic AMP, which binds to and activates protein kinase A, which phosphorylates many proteins, including a transcription factor called CREB. When CREB is phosphorylated, it moves into the nucleus. It binds to the transcriptional regulatory element of the PEPCK gene shown here. A bunch of other proteins bind, and additionally, the glucocorticoid, the steroid hormone, binds its steroid hormone receptor, the glucocorticoid receptor, which is also a transcription factor. And when all these elements are bound together, we have maximal stimulation of PEPCK gene expression. The other, nucle the other gluconeogenic enzymes are stimulated in a very similar fashion. Now, after we eat, insulin levels in the blood rise, and it's time to shut down gluconeogenesis. One way in which this occurs is that through the, the insulin receptor tyrosine kinase, a protein um, kinase is activated called AKT, which activates a phosphatase, protein phosphatase 1, which removes phosphates off of many proteins, including CREB, and CREB leaves the nucleus. Additionally, AKT phosphorylates the transcriptional factor FOXO, and the whole protein complex begins to fall apart. Phosphorylated FOXO leaves the nucleus, and PEPCK gene expression is inhibited, just like all the other gluconeogenic-specific enzymes during insulin signaling. Note also that gluconeogenesis requires a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. So the carboxylation of pyruvate down here requires ATP, here, the PEPCK requires ATP or GTP. Here in the middle, we, we uh, utilize ATP. Again, if we're coming in from glycerol, there's ATP utilized. And remember, down at the bottom part of this pathway, these are all three carbon intermediates, and you need two of them. So we double in order to make this six carbon glucose. So where do the hepatocytes get the energy to do gluconeogenesis? Hopefully you realize it's not going to be glycolysis because under conditions where gluconeogenesis is activated largely through transcription, glycolysis is inhibited. Hmm. So during fasting, where does the liver get its energy from? Well, from fatty acid oxidation. So like many tissues in the body during the state of fasting, glucose is spared and fatty acids are oxidized or burned for energy. So given that gluconeogenesis is an ATP using anabolic pathway, what protein kinase do you think phosphorylates and inhibits the gluconeogenic specific enzymes? Yeah, AMP activated protein kinase or AMPK 
phosphorylates, Pepsi K phosphorylates, uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and glucose 6-phosphatase, inhibiting them and preventing gluconeogenesis if the liver senses that it's running out of ATP. And this becomes important when we think about diabetes. And, under, and when people have untreated diabetes, gluconeogenesis is uninhibited. Remember, diabetes mellitus results when either there's not enough insulin or not enough insulin to overcome insulin resistance in tissues. So when someone has untreated diabetes, the liver synthesizes glucose out of control. Even when blood glucose levels are high, the liver dumps glucose into the blood. And metformin, one of the most common drugs used to treat type 2 diabetes, functions at least partly by activating AMP-activated protein kinase in hepatocytes to inhibit gluconeogenesis. Okay, let's summarize. Gluconeogenesis is the de novo synthesis of glucose from lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. It occurs in hepatocytes and sometimes in the kidney cortex. Gluconeogenesis is essentially the reverse of glycolysis with a few unique steps. These unique steps, catalyzed by specific enzymes, allow it to be regulated opposite of glycolysis. Additionally, for each one of the unique steps, they are ATP requiring either for glycolysis or gluconeogenesis, and this allows both of these processes to be energetically favorable. Insulin signaling inhibits gluconeogenesis, while glucagon and cortisol both activate gluconeogenesis primarily through transcriptional mechanisms. And finally, Gluconeogenesis is inappropriately activated in untreated diabetes. Metformin, a very commonly used drug to treat type 2 diabetes, works by inhibiting gluconeogenesis in an insulin-independent mechanism by activating AMP-activated protein kinase.